Today he'll speak to us about how Urban is supporting co-production, the logic underpinning that uh, ways forward, and anything else he may choose to raise. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me start thanking uh, the university and uh, Peta, Julia, and uh, Benjamin for inviting me. As you heard, uh, I didn't know you were going to do my biography. <laughs> As you heard, I started my career in academia and I uh, did my PhD studies and then uh, I worked uh, at the university in Italy. And uh, the temptation though to uh, put my hands into uh, filmmaking, to production, from the public sector point of view, not as a producer, but as a, as a public funder, was so, the temptation was so strong that I decided to abandon academia and uh, join first the media program and now uh, every match since uh, 15 years. <laughs> a long time. <clears throat> Um, Peter, uh, when he came to uh, Strasbourg, he asked me to uh, try to share with you my ideas of uh, where co-production is going. And uh, I told him that if I knew better, <coughs> I wouldn't be in every match. I probably would be um, uh, bigger than Zentopa and uh, rich somewhere in Hollywood. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is to share with you some thoughts. I thought to do um, something a bit entertaining because it's the first uh, um, presentation in the morning and some of you are still maybe in party yesterday but you're still a little bit sleepy so I thought something more entertaining. Um, yes, let's start. I think um, from my position in Arimage, uh, 37 countries um, in Europe, except the UK, sorry Jonathan. Um, there are three trends, uh, three trends that we can find at least. The first one uh, is in uh, um, the one. <laughs> the trends in the market. The second is like, in the regulation, and the third is in the content. Now, in our image, we have witnessed an increase in the number of co-production applying for funding. Uh, this follows a general trend in the increase of films made in Europe. Uh, in general, the European Audiovisual Observatory publishes every year the, um, the focus in Cannes. And uh, every year we realize that the number is growing. And uh, we can ask ourselves several questions. So, um, Julia said yesterday that yesterday you asked yourself a lot of questions. I'm asking you even more questions today. And uh, hopefully you guys are going to find the answers. Um, there has been a financial crisis, so the market money is harder to find than public money. That is certainly one of the causes, something that I've witnessed in every match since five, six, seven years, is that uh, the minimum guarantees, uh, meaning the advance that distributors would um, pay on script, uh, meaning without seeing the film, so it's pre-financing, or intervention of televisions, except France, France is an exception, are, have decreased enormously. So risks uh, in the market are so high uh, for several reasons that um, uh, there is less um, private money, market money, and therefore everybody knocks on the door of public funds. It is also easier to make a production, in my opinion, as compared to the past. So there is a dedicated regulatory environment. Dedicated meaning there are a lot more bilateral treaties. So the European Convention that exists since many years has been widely used now and is uh, nearly democratized. Um, there is less prejudice towards co-production. When I was working in the media program before I joined uh, Early Manage, uh, that means uh, until 2001, uh, there was this prejudice around Europe according to which um, co-productions were the kind of films that you make if, you, if the film is too weird <laughs> and you cannot find financing and you know your own territory and what you do, you knock on the door of other territories. So co-productions were for, you know, for losers maybe or for, you know, if some people would say you're pudding or, you know, this film nobody wants to see, too intellectuals and so on. 
um, there is less prejudice towards co-production because uh, um, when the uh, observatory published um, um, a document, a research on co-productions, people realized that in order to make a co-production you have to raise financing in several territories and that means that the script, same script has to pass selective support schemes in every country. So contrary to the prejudice that people had until then, um, the script has to be bloody good to go through every single public fund in the different countries, televisions and distributors. So there has been a reversal of the idea co-production are actually pretty good film because they cross audiences and can be understood and appreciated by um, different cultures, different markets, um, different people. So there is less prejudice. I don't know if uh, the um, observatory study was a turning point, and certainly it gave, um, how can I put it, a scientific basis to the feelings and impressions that people had uh, have had until now. And then there is a lot more financing reserve for co-productions uh, until um, maybe five or eight years ago. Uh, very few, um, very few uh, funds had reserved um, co-production support for minority co-productions. I hope you understand the uh, subtle difference between reserving money in a fund for majority co-productions and for minority co-productions. When you reserve money for minority co-production, it means that a fund is reserving money for a film that is not shot in one language, and the director most of the time comes from another country, and so does the cast. So basically, that fund is putting money on a film from elsewhere. And this has been a, a, an historical moment in many funds to be able to reserve that money. The Danish Film Institute has done some years ago, and there is um, quite some money now available for minority co-productions, but until uh, some time ago, in many funds in Europe, minority co-productions had to compete with majority co-productions. So can you imagine having, I don't know, Paolo Sorrentino in Italy competing with um, Susanne Beer uh, in Italy, Susanne Beer shooting in maybe in English, uh, not in Italy, except the comedy that she made recently. Um, of course, the money would, if it is a select support, the money would go to Italian content and not to uh, non-Italian content. So, the fact there is more money reserved for co-production has certainly increased the number of co-production. Very much has become also a quality label um, uh, recently and that triggers extra funding. Um, there has, that has been actually a complication. I don't know if you, I, I noticed in the program that you guys have talked about very much already yesterday. But I don't know if you uh, pointed out that uh, the uh, idea very much at the beginning was um, uh, to make sure that uh, projects that had reached a certain level of financing would get the last 10-20% necessary to close the, the budget. As you may know, um, if you have worked a little bit in production, the last 20% in financing is the most difficult money to find. Mm -hmm. It is easier to start funding the first money for your script, it is extremely difficult to close your budget. And producers, most of the time, what they have, what they do is uh, um, either they reduce the budget of 10%, 20%, and you can see it on screen. Because the idea, the basic idea of the project uh, is betrayed somehow, the, the producer cannot find uh, sufficient money to make the film in the best condition possible. Or, in some countries, producers um, accept very tough conditions, for instance, from banks, and that puts the, the company in great difficulty. So, an image has been conceived to come at the very end of the financing process, giving those films that we believe deserve that kind of last kick, uh, the money to make the film in the best conditions possible. Now, if, since the image has become a quality label, um, many funds, many televisions, many distributors wait for an image to give the label. And therefore, what we have on the, on the desk is not what we see, <laughs> because the producer knows that um, if every manager is on board, then he or she will be able to get the television or the public fund or any other investor that comes later. So every manager has become, now we are in a catch-22 situation whereby we should be the last in, and we're, in reality we are among the, the, you know, the first
first ones in and the financing plan that is put under our eyes is not what is going to be in the future. So this is the, um, I believe, uh, one of the explanations that I could find uh, why we are receiving uh, more uh, funding. Uh, in terms of low budget films, um, after this, uh, this uh, keynote speech, I'm going to the Danish Film Institute to talk about uh, low budget and big budget film. And uh, I have a, um, a statistics about the quantity of uh, low budget films in every month that is quite surprising. Uh, we started in 2009 with uh, 20 projects per year with a budget less than 1 million 500 years, 1.5. And we'd end up in 2015 with 62 projects. So from 2009 to 2015, we passed from 20 to 62. I'm talking about only projects less than 1.5 million euros. So there has been an explosion of co productions made and co production knocking on our door. Maybe these are some of the reasons they explain what's going on in the market. There is a, uh, always uh, as a trend in the market, polarization of budgets. Uh, there is a dramatic increase of low budget films, uh, meaning less than 1 million uh, point five, and uh, the uh, disappearance nearly, a decrease, a strong decrease of medium budget from 1.5 to 3 million years. Now, is this due to the fact that public funding available is spread over a large number of co-production, thus decreasing the average budget? The increase in money available uh, for co-production in the different funds is uh, maybe not as high as the increase in the number of co-production. Therefore, you have to share the cake with more guests, and therefore less money available, less money available, lower budgets. Does the increase in the low budget film impact the distribution strategy? Uh, I fear yes. Uh, now this connects a little bit with what uh, maybe Anna is going to talk about later in digital. What, you know, the, what the digital market uh, is, how it is impacting in the way we um, um, uh, see films. Uh, <clears throat> something that um, uh, we realized is that uh, before festivals were um, a way for the film to get some sort of promotion uh, that would in probably help distributors, uh, say the agent distributors in particular, get to know the existence of the film and therefore pick the film and buy it and distribute it in their own territory. Now, festival has become itself a way of distributing film because there are so many films available that distributors cannot pick all of them and, uh, and uh, end up... Um, whoop, <laughs> 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 you see that already? <laughs> few alternative distribution strategies compared to theatrical exploitation. Festival, in my opinion, has become an alternative to a locked cinema theatre market. It can be put as a question, but that's what I strongly believe. There are less cinema theatre, there are more films. Um, now, those films uh, that are produced, uh, you know, films are produced to be seen in theory, and not to be uh, put on a shelf. Uh, so festivals maybe have become themselves a way to distribute films. Now, from an economical point of view, does that make sense? Meaning the fee that a festival pays to the producer, does that compensate, does that set off the lack of theatrical distribution? Uh, the, if the screens are decreasing, if the number of films are increasing, what's left for very art house difficult films. Everybody is talking about VOD. Oh, VOD is a new way of distributing, distributing films. How many, uh, how many times per week do you actually watch films on VOD? And what kind of film do you find on VOD? Try to do it. Try to go to Netflix. Try to go to any other digital platform on any form of exploitation of, uh, of digital exploitation of the film and see what is available and how they're positioned. If the film is not known, it can be in a catalog, BOD, but it's like a book in a library. If it is not in the archives, you don't know it exists. So how is BOD contributing to the distribution of films and moreover to the making of them? I'll open a little parenthesis 
for those uh, you're very young, most of you are very young, and you don't remember that we have had the same problem with uh, television and with uh, home video and with DVD. Every time there's a new way of exploiting films, uh, cinema people go like, ah, oh, it's the end of cinema. Uh, people will watch TV, they will never go to the cinema. People will watch home video, they will never go to the cinema. People will watch DVD, they will never go to the cinema. In, it didn't happen, cinema still exists, but the regulation had an important role until then. Television is obliged to invest in film. If you exploit content, you must be responsible to make sure that it's a sustainable system and therefore that films can be made. And uh, investment quotas, um, the uh, Television Without Frontiers director that became Audiovisual Services director imposes some kind of uh, programming quotas and also encourages investment quotas as well. Um, the uh, video on demand, uh, sorry, the uh, home video and the DVD, when they existed, they were the most important source of exploitation of the film. Some of you do not know, but when you uh, exploit theatrically a film, very rarely the revenues generated by theatrical exploitation cover even the cost of the launching of the film. That means that a distributor that acquires the rights for a film must have a business plan able, that enables him, that allows him to recoup the cost that he has spent in order to launch the film theatrically. Now, if a, video, if a DVD does not exist anymore, and um, a home video does not exist anymore, and DVD market is basically disappearing, what's next? Now, VOD is not really contributing yet in the financing. It would, you know, when I look at the financing plan of a film, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you would have pre-sale minima guarantee, where the rights were crossed, you would have a theatrical, home video or DVD, and television. Uh, but a DVD or a home video, would, the value would break a lot of money, allowing the distributor to cross the cost and be able to make his business sustainable and, uh, and profitable. This is not happening anymore. I don't see pre-sales of VOD uh, in my financing plan for the time being, because VOD uh, platforms are not obliged yet to invest in films. So that money is lacking. Basically, we're, we're, we're passing from a business model in which uh, theatrical exploitation, the lack of resources from theatrical exploitation were compensated by the exploitation in theater, in a, a, a home video and DVD, to a system where this lack of resources are not compensated. And uh, uh, of course, if the money is not there in the market, where do you find it? Public funds. Netflix and the multi-territorial licensing. Um, Netflix is a wonderful invention um, and it's a paradise for uh, those who uh, enjoy filmmaking and, uh, and different kind of films. However, the fact that it's not regulated implies that when they buy all the rights, the film cannot be seen anywhere else but on their platform. And the film does not exist if it is not shown. And there are many titles that we are seeing, you know, producers and distributors, they are experimenting themselves, you know, let's try to see what it means to sell the film to Netflix and uh, get a big chunk of money, but that's the only money you will get. And you will not be able to sell it in any, any other territory. So is Netflix the future? Probably it is, the multi-licensing, um, the multi-territoriality in licensing, but uh, can, you know, we, we are able to count, we should be able to understand if this is sustainable for the um, producers and distributors in Europe. <coughs> Trends in the regulatory environment. Uh, am I going too slow? No. We still have um, half an hour? 20 minutes? Yeah. 20 minutes. Uh, there is a growth in the number of bilateral treaties signed between countries, also between non-European countries. 
uh, you are academic in, uh, academics in the, uh, in the audiovisual sector, you know that the first bilateral treaties were invented in Europe, in France and Italy. And uh, France and Canada now are the champions in terms of bilateral treaties. Um, this model uh, that has been invented uh, <clears throat> has been exported, uh, like in many other sectors. Europe has invented a lot of stuff and, and set the, somehow the, um, the standard. And now there are bilateral treaties that are signed between non-European countries themselves. Uh, there is a treaty between India and Brazil, for instance. Uh, so the, the network of treaties that are being made uh, is becoming uh, is increasing and is becoming more complex. So this is a trend that we are witnessing. We are also witnessing a trend that I, it legally doesn't make any sense, but is certainly an expression of um, political interest. Um, most of the uh, European countries have signed and ratified the European Convention on Co-Production, as you know. Uh, for countries that do not have a dedicated bilateral treaty between themselves, the European <coughs> Convention offers a platform for bilateral co-productions, except France, of course. Um, France cannot use the European Convention for bilateral co-productions. They only can use the European Convention for multilateral co-productions. Why? Because they like to decide with whom they want to co-produce and what percentage they want to have. You know, you're a nice guy, I give you 20%, uh, uh, Anna is not nice, I give her 30%, and Julia is very, very nice, I give her 10%. So it's a bilateral, dedicated relationship, so the European Convention for them only applies for multilateral, not for bilateral. There are countries that already have sign a ratified European Convention and therefore the bilateral treaties should not be necessary because uh, the Convention already uh, offers um, a framework for bilateral co-productions. Despite that, they are doing bilateral treaty themselves. Now, legally, it's not necessary. The reason why they're doing it is an expression of political interest. They, they are basically flexing their muscles, showing interest uh, in each other's culture somehow. So legally, it's not adding anything more. But this is happening. So growth in the number of bilateral treaties signed between countries. Um, we have finally reached the level of revision <laughs> of the European Convention. Um, we started in 2008. There was an interesting conference organized by the Council of Europe in Krakow, in Poland, um, uh, Council of Europe and the Polish Film Institute at that time. Um, and uh, uh, it was a review of national policies, basically. It was a moment in which um, uh, countries got together to um, uh, you know, present uh, their uh, expectation for the future in terms of national public uh, cinematographic policy. And one of the um, uh, conclusions of that, uh, of that uh, conference was the revision of the European Convention. It took us from 2008 to um, June 2016 to have that text approved by the uh, committee ministers. As you know, a treaty has been to be transposed into national law. It has to go through the parliament and, and be enshrined in a national law. So it will take a couple of years still to make it happen, but you know, you have to start somewhere and that's the let's call it beauty uh, and complexity of uh, um, European cooperation. Now, what do we do in the European Convention, the revision of the European Convention? Um, as I said, it's open for signature in Rotterdam on the 30th of January 2017. Why Rotterdam? Because Rotterdam is in the Netherlands and uh, uh, the uh, president of the, um, re um, of the committee that was uh, uh, rewriting uh, the convention um, was Dutch. Is Dutch still there? It is uh, uh, Doreen Bonnekamp, the head of the Dutch Fund, an extremely clever um, civil servant. And uh, she, since, since she was the president, she gave such an uh, impulse in the uh, revision that it is simply normal that we do it in the Netherlands. We have lowered the percentages of the for the bilateral treaties, so from 80 20 to 90 10, uh, and in multilateral co production from uh, 70. 10 to 85. Now this should allow smaller countries to be able to participate in bigger budgets, uh, bigger co-productions. Uh, before, uh, for uh, smaller territories, being able to, in a budget treaty, to find 20% uh, 
of uh, money uh, was basically impossible. They would cut out uh, from you know important corporations, smaller territories. So this uh, the idea was clearly to um, um, uh, allow smaller territories to join the club somehow and, and play um, uh, in the best way possible. It is open to non-European countries, just like Gobimage is now. Um, Canada is joining uh, by the end of the year. The whole procedure has been completely uh, 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 it has been completed. Now it is, you know, we're waiting for the exchange of letters uh, between ministers, and uh, hopefully by the first of January, Canada is joining the fund. And uh, the European Convention is uh, not anymore called the European Convention, it's called, going to be called the Council of Europe Convention on International Co-Production. So the dream is to have one text one day for all the countries around the world. Instead of having thousands of uh, dedicated bilateral treaties that make the joy of lawyers around the world, but probably it's going to be the headache of producers and uh, filmmakers. Um, so, <coughs> I mean, I'm not going to go into details about the technicalities that were changed. You know, the revision implies also um, uh, a, change, a change in language. You know, there's not such a thing anymore as a negative uh, as we used to have in treaties. Uh, we don't even call it DCP anymore because uh, you know, in a couple of years there will not be a DCP. There will be something different. So we try to infuse a more neutral language in the treaty that allows its um, adaptability uh, with future um, technological developments. And then again, as I was saying before, territorial licensing is under attack at the EU level. Um, uh, the idea of having uh, this individual territory uh, being sold uh, for the exploitation of the film and therefore for the financing of the film, because when you pre-sale uh, the territory that money allows the financing plan to uh, uh, find resources to uh, make the film. Um, it is true that uh, the recently the debate, and Anna maybe can be more precise than me for sure, has moved from territoriality to portability, and uh, the uh, idea of territoriality in filmmaking is less under attack. But you know, we can still ask ourselves, is this sustainable? Is this going to last forever? Um, in a market, uh, European market is, uh, um, in theory, a single market since 92. Um, uh, we still have this fragmentation. This fragmentation is essential for the business model that we have now. Without that fragmentation, films, the way we see it now, will not be able to exist and companies will not be able to exist. How many of you know a company that is able to pre-acquire rights like Netflix does for the whole Europe? Berlusconi maybe? <laughs> And, and still, I'm not sure. He will certainly buy the very commercial films, not the uh, other films. So, the, <coughs> from from a, from an intellectual point of view, um, multi-territoriality makes sense. From a legal point of view, uh, it completely makes sense. It is a way to complete the single digital market. From a pure production point of view, is suicidal today. Unless we think that having uh, too many films in Europe. Uh, is negative, and therefore we shall um, have a more practical approach and think that um, you know diversity, <coughs> diversity is not anymore a value, uh, pluralism is not anymore a value, and therefore we can make films for the market and give what the people want. That rings a bell. It doesn't like it. No. <laughs> no. Well, you know, for the time being, we manage it is uh, um, a cultural fund, it's not an economic fund. Uh, we do not have the same objective as a national funds. It's a selective, uh, we only have 25 million euros for 37 countries, so you can understand that it's uh, certainly not in the industrial policy ground that we're working, it's more on the cultural, symbolic um, level that we're working, and that is the whole DNA of the fund. Um, uh, so, uh, for us, uh, for Eurimage, for the Council of Europe, at least, diversity is a value uh, for itself. Um, and uh, um, uh, as long as films find their own audience, not the larger audience, but their own audience, that can be very niche, but it's dedicated for that audience, 
then the film makes sense and deserves to be made and uh, allows uh, European citizens, hopefully beyond Europe, the possibility to access that content and uh, to find um, in audiovisual uh, terms what they're looking for. Trends in the film content. Don't be scared, I'm not talking about content in terms of uh, dramaturgy. Um, it's, uh, you know, there is a, a, a clear trend that everybody uh, has been witnessing since some time. There's an aging cinema uh, goers around. Uh, the uh, average age is between 40 and 60. Um, I'm talking about independent art house uh, European films. Uh, independent films in general. So we can ask ourselves, uh, in our image and in the uh, independent filmmakers in Europe, but for whom are we making films? Uh, the question is, uh, it may sound um, superficial, and it certainly is to a certain degree, but um, uh, it, it is a linked to the last point that I'm um, uh, mentioning, is that public funds have always considered themselves as curators. Um, curators, meaning, uh, like in an art collection, um, you propose to the public what you consider to be uh, quality, what you consider to be original, what you consider to be innovative. Now, the way it is made, it is done, changes from country to country. In this territory, in this country, Denmark has invented this, uh, the art of single decision making which is uh, revolutionary, crazy revolutionary, uh, and it works very well though in the northern part of Europe. So it's one person that decides, and that is uh, based on the idea that the creative process is intuitive, and it's certainly not necessarily democratic. Democracy comes with compromise and with uh, decisions that are certainly not necessarily the best decision. And politically we know how many times we have to vote, to vote for the less dangerous person that is proposed to us, while uh, the creative process is more guts um, and it's at the borderline with, uh, with uh, you know, irrational and um, decision making. Um, can we still consider public funds as curators? Uh, are we, um, uh, you know, consider that the offer that we're making is appealing to only a very tiny chunk of the population, the 40 years old. What about the rest of the people? And this opens up another parenthesis that is important, that is now the competence of co-productions and their image in particular, that is uh, media literacy. Uh, young people, uh, and you somehow belong to that category, most of you, uh, you were born with internet, you uh, watch uh, your um, digital devices all the time, but most, you know, television, computer, whatever uh, um, uh, device you have, uh, but very few of us were um, educated to analyze and have a critical approach to audiovisual content. Uh, so, we are leaving the 40 under uh, population to anything that is uh, thrown by uh, internet or made by other countries as well. But don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we have to erect barriers to impede uh, those, that content to, come, to enter uh, Europe. But what I'm trying to say is that we, the curators, are making films for a tiny segment of the population. The rest is a desert. Anything goes. So, I think... I think that um, um, media literacy is important, but also we should uh, ourselves ask the questions. Maybe we should make films also for the 40 under. And uh, uh, that opens a little parenthesis. Um, oh, it's gone. No signal. Yes. Yeah. Here we go. Um, the uh, research and development in the film sector, uh, <clears throat> that is something that uh, many um, Funds do, and uh, the Danish Film Institute does it since a long time with a lot of money, and that's uh, certainly a good example. That means trying to uh, dirty our hands, try new things, and uh, uh, find a way to bring the audience back 
to the uh, cinema or to, uh, if it is not in the cinema, bring in that content that we make uh, in Europe um, uh, into the screens of uh, younger generation. In every match we've launched recently uh, <coughs> a scheme that is tiny, that it was very difficult. It took me three years to convince the board of management to go that, down that lane. Um, and that is uh, non-scripted uh, projects. Uh, the way uh, filmmaking has evolved in, uh, in, in the last 20 years uh, is uh, uh, not reflected somehow in the way funds keep on selecting films. Films are selected still on the basis of the package that the producer will the filmmaker, with the, with the director, bring to us. And the script is the cornerstone of the decision making which uh, is fine for a certain type of cinema. I'm not talking, talking necessarily about a three-act script, the classic dramaturgical uh, pattern. I'm talking about projects that are made in such a way that uh, improvisation and the concept is at the basis of the uh, artistic proposal that the director is bringing to us. And El Image would regularly cut the throat of all those projects because we didn't understand them. We, you know, we would expect a 90, at least a 90 pages script, one, min, one page, one minute, more or less, and anything that would go beyond that pattern was, we don't understand the implementation of the main character. Um, the protagonist, uh, no, the antagonist is not creating dramatic tension. You know, that classic dramaturgy approach that um, we, you know, some, those of you who did film school have uh, learned. But you know, we're going in, in around and we're not allowing cinematography to evolve and to, to, um, to, you know, to go towards the future. Uh, there is a person that inspired um, this change. Um, certainly the Danish Film Institute has been um, incredibly inspiring, but there is a person uh, and his name is Katriel Shorek. He's the head of the Israeli Film Fund. He's an incredible, incredibly clever person. Uh, he actually changed, in my opinion, the face of Israeli cinema uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, he invented um, a scheme that is called the Guerrilla Funding uh, Support Scheme. Now, you know, Israel, war, guerrilla, it, you know, it's, it's coherent. We, in Europe, we don't like war, we call it um, the, the lab project. But the, uh, <laughs> but the concept is more or less the same. Uh, what he has been doing, basically, uh, forget the script. Many projects do not have scripts, and, uh, but they, they deserve to be made. Um, the filmmakers go to him with a concept, they pitch the, 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 the concept, and, you know, they can have one page uh, note, and if the concept, the artistic concept, is appealing, he starts giving you little money, you go out, start shooting, bring back the material, we watch it together, and if it deserves, uh, if you see there is material to you keep on working on, you keep on feeding the making of the film until the film is finished. Now, in every match, we have 37 countries, and it's a little bit more complex in terms of decision making. So, we decided that we could not use the same pattern, and we use festivals uh, through work in progress to do that kind of uh, approach. So, instead of judging projects on script, some projects do not have scripts, we judge projects on visuals. And in work in progress, films are not finished yet, either they are still shooting and they are looking for money. Uh, financiers to help them close in the budget, or they need the money to uh, edit it, and therefore to the budget. And uh, Image has uh, launched this scheme uh, this year. We have only 200,000 years out of the 25 million years. So normally, research and development should be 10%, but you know, better than nothing, we had to start with something, and that's the only peanuts that they gave me for the time being. Um, and uh, that is the way that uh, Image is going, and that's the way that many other um, uh, funds are going. I personally think that uh, this uh, system is going to reach a moment of uh, saturation and we're getting close to that, in my opinion, because we're making more and more and more and more film. They are very similar one to the other. The age, uh, the average age of the cinema goer is getting older. What are we going to do with all this material? Open museums? 
Um, so time has come for uh, the funders uh, and all the policy makers to uh, get together and uh, adapt uh, to the future. And maybe, you no, know, we I think we need to dirty our hands to try to do new things. And by dirtying our hands and trying new things, maybe some good things will come out. And if you don't make mistakes, you cannot learn from your own mistakes, you cannot advance. So um, that's what I think uh, the future should be. Uh, hopefully the border manager will give me a little bit more than 200,000 years. And, uh, and, uh, and we can contribute to modernizing uh, cinema and make sure that our role of curators uh, is not patronizing, but is actually giving the chance to filmmakers to make their film. And I think we're done. <laughs>
the editorial line that Harry Majors had until now was we should try to support films that the market alone cannot make. <coughs> Meaning that, and that answered a little bit the question of do they need us? Um, there are films that are too controversial because they treat topics that in some countries are not easy to deal with. Um, uh, it can be, uh, you know, it can be larger concept of human rights. It can be uh, gender. It can be sexual orientation. It can be anything. But it can also be a <coughs> different point of view. You know, the French call this a film d'auteur. Is a point of view d'auteur. Is a personal perspective on a story. It's not purely entertaining. It's a point of view. It's a subjective point of view. And some of the films that we support are, have a different point of view, meaning that it's not the mainstream point of view. It can be very controversial. You know, some historians can scream and shout at them and go like, you're rewriting history and so on. We are trying to give the voice to those filmmakers that maybe do not think like the larger audience. And therefore, the way we make films, we support films, is on merit, as you said, meaning that we believe that among all those films that would deserve funding, we have to select, and how do you select, on originality and you know, innovative uh, content. Then you can discuss for, you know, for, for hours what it is innovative and what it, you know, what it is original and so on. And let me tell you, after the discussion, the board of managers is blood all over the place. Huh? It's, uh, it's, it's, of course, we, we agree to disagree. But that's the way if uh, we, we, make, we support films. If we could support films beyond, um, beyond uh, merit and, uh, and not on content but on need, we'd not, we wouldn't be a cultural fund. The Council of Europe has no competence in economic matters. That is the European Union. The reason why Every Manager exists, I don't know if some of you have uh, studied this, that, that was one of the uh, topics in my PhD is that basically in a nutshell, I can tell you in two minutes, um, when the media program was uh, conceived, was tried, they were trying to conceive the media program in the 80s. Um, there were three countries that were strongly opposing um, uh, the uh, inclusion of production into what was going to be the media program. There was Germany, because of uh, constitutional law matters. Culture is not a federal competence, it is a lender. Competence, so the Federation could not commit on that. Um, then we come to prejudices, uh, and uh, the Netherlands thought that you know that was too costly, and uh, you know the Dutch didn't want to pay, and the Brits are the Brits, of course. <laughs> the Brits, uh, the Brits, uh, by definition, are no. Um, so we had the UK, the Netherlands, and uh, Germany that in the obliged uh, the Union at that time, the European communities, to um, exclude content production from uh, the media program. They considered production to be too close to culture and therefore they didn't have, it was before Maastricht, and they, uh, the Treaty of Maastricht, uh, and it was, uh, you know, the European Union does, did not have competence in that matter. Now. At that time, France was a pioneer, and still is somehow, in defending uh, um, support to culture and to cinema. And therefore, if you cannot enter from the main door of the European Union, you enter from the window of the Council of Europe. And they changed the legal framework, and they went to the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe, I don't know if you guys know the difference between the European Union and the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe is not the European Union, it's the larger organization in Europe, it's like the United Nations of Europe that has no competence whatsoever in economic matters, it only has competence in human rights and social issues. Early Manage has been created in the Council of Europe because the Council of Europe is not a supranational organization, it's an intergovernmental organization, meaning that countries individually decide a la carte if they want to cooperate yes or no in some subjects. Early Manage is 37 countries out of the 47 of the Council of Europe. So, à la carte, some countries decide to join the fund. Of course, Germany did want to be excluded. The Dutch made their calculations and they joined the fund. The Brits are the Brits. 
and they stayed out. I mean, they joined, and then since they were actually earning too much money as compared to what they were paying, they decided to pull out, because it's logic. And, uh, um, and so uh, the way um, it is working is that our mandate is purely cultural. Um, of course, you may say, and rightly so, you guys intervene in an industry, like it or not, and there are needs in the industry that have to be satisfied. So the economic part of the of every image takes into consideration the um, economic aspects of the films, but our mandate is purely cultural, and that makes it complementary um, to the media program, and that's why still the media program is not dealing, even though they could if they wanted to, uh, in the production sector, and every image is doing it in the council of Europe. There is this um, this. Um, um, Complementarity, I don't know how to, I can't find the word in English for a sound cast, they match together somehow. Um, so we wouldn't be able to go any further than that. Uh, we would not be able to have a, um, any support scheme that is industrial oriented because we do not have the competence for that. And that would be challenged by the European Union. The, the European Union has an automatic support scheme with the media program in distribution. We don't. We don't because we, we are based on selective support. It is cultural. It is cultural, European cultural policy in a nutshell. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to cut the questions sh short here, but we have a time pressure. So thank you very much.